Nice to meet you. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm good. Um, believe it or not, this is actually daytime. We've got zero light in the UK at the minute. So, um, Yeah, what is it? It's like it, three, four o'clock by you? No, just quarter past one. Oh, okay. Nice. Yeah, this, the daylight disappeared by midday. So Cool. It is bright and early, eight in the morning over here. You dedicated. I have to, man, to to keep keep this going and keep everyone get everyone on it. Like, I got to be able to hop on earlier, That's hop cool. on late, because you know, got a full time work schedule on top of this. Yeah, definitely. All right, where to start? Um, so you're based in the UK. That's right, Newcastle, uh, which is in the northeast by Scotland. Okay, cool, and I guess what I'm curious about is like what the photography scene is like in the UK, because I've only seen bits and pieces of it through Instagram. Um, very connected to the educational scene. Like, um, you'll very rarely find a city with a strong photography scene that doesn't have a pretty notable photography degree course or heritage within the local university. So Brighton is pretty much the epicenter of everything outside of London. Um, they have a biennial and a, a photo fringe attached to that, which has got a huge support from Brighton University and lots of ex-Brighton alumni. Um, I think Bristol has something similar. Derby also, which is in the Midlands. Where I live, Newcastle, it's quite isolated geographically. Well, like the last big cultural city before you get to Scotland and then there's not really that much for about two hours south of here other than another city called uh, Sunderland I think like New York to New Jersey sort of like we're connected mm -hmm. like that um, Sunderland has for being a smaller city has a much stronger art scene in general um, uh, during the last recession, a lot of councils cut arts funding, often by 100% of the budget. And Newcastle was one city that um, that happened in. So opportunities are quite scarce in Newcastle. Mm -hmm. um, and I think photography exists, perhaps in the, the wider art scene, as I guess I'll probably fear more towards the fine art end of photography. Like the conceptual end, so I can cross over a little bit with the, the fine art scene. But like a, a photography scene doesn't really exist in Newcastle in any any way you could quantify in most cities. Yeah, that that makes sense. I've heard, I've seen a lot of stuff out of Brighton, so it makes sense what you're saying. And then a hundred percent art budget cut, like 100%. from like the state level. Yes crazy um, what the it, fuck yeah it, it's so short-sighted um it's not even a case of like the most conservative um councils doing so it, it's literally just like a, a, a book balancing issue um, a lot of councils are just hugely underfunded and and if it's like arts get funded or kids at school can't be fed you know like yeah, as, as an artist, you know, obviously I don't want arts funding cut, but like, all these councils are really hanging on by a, a thread. And there, I mean, there are other places for funding. We have like a big organisation called the Arts Council, which um, pops up a lot, like an awful lot of um, art in the UK. Um, I've never, I mean, I've not really tried for years to get funding from, but I've got a full time job. I don't have an expensive practice. You know, I'm not of means particularly. I don't have a, a well-paying job, but I'm good at budgeting and it doesn't cost me much to live. So I don't really need that in the way that some people's practice couldn't exist without funding. Yeah, I imagine it's probably pretty tough to like have like a large sculpture practice out there. I don't think that's... I, don't, I think it's untenable um, without having wealth behind you mm -hmm. or some way that it could be used commercially. Um, and of course, in cities, the space is an issue as well. It's, um, 
there's lots of buildings in, to use an example, like when the Low East Side got um, sort of gentrified 20, 30 years ago, um, when you had a lot of artist studios that got they moved out, it's becoming that way in pretty much any cool area of any city in Newcastle. Um, and we have like quite strict health and safety laws, so moving into disused buildings isn't always the easiest thing. The, the having that DIY studio space, it can't be particularly DIY. It needs to meet fire, uh, needs to be able to meet fire hazards and health and safety things. And yeah, you can't just like show up and kind no. of get away with whatever. No, I think our laws are quite strict with that, so you couldn't just sign a waiver. I think um, in the States, there's quite a lot of freedoms to give up your rights, if you wish, um, which we just don't <laughs> have. Um, and it's a good thing, but it, it can mean that kind of fast-paced studio doesn't happen. Yeah, you got to like be more considerate with your time and resources. 100%. Um, it's something I always say to young artists who ask for advice is... Um, Time management and budget management is a huge thing. It's, it's not in the slightest bit interesting, but that's what will grow your practice is being able to operate your time and your, your finances. And every decent artist I know that's not of wealth is an expert at that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it's something that they do not teach you in school either. No. It's like yeah, something yeah. you really have to figure out the hard way. It's a pet hate of mine that, um, like the realities of being a an artist, they, it, you're not taught the sacrifice that you're going to have to make, and that that can be on quite a minor scale. You know, I, I don't mean not eating to afford pain, and that that sort of like dramatic sacrifice, but you, like being able to fit your practice in in a in a way that you can do sustainably over the long term after a. I work in a record shop. It's not a difficult job. I come home, I've got energy. I'm a night owl, so I can, I can throw quite a lot of time into my work. Someone who has a more physical job or a more mentally draining job, mm-hmm. that, that energy budget is difficult. Yeah, you're telling me. Mm. Or like, um, at least what I've experienced is like the mental draining part Like, makes it like very tough for me to make anything afterwards which is why i'm like trying to fit in you know recordings or like creative time like early in the morning before i like get going so it's like easier for me to head out and have the day and then like you know if i'm like exhausted at the end i don't feel so bad because i missed out on a studio day exactly and you know an artist has to have a real life because otherwise what are you just a creation machine you know, you need to be able to spend time with friends, family, loved ones, and and do the things that aren't an artist. They're, they're on, they, you know, the, the part, I guess they are part of being an artist, but they're not like, part of the practice. So. Yeah, you need to live. You have to experience things to be able to make them and translate. 100%. Otherwise, you're like, literally, it's like, what are you doing? You're just, uh, you're just a, like a, what is it? A creative department at a company, but it's yeah. like the company is yourself. Like it's weird. Yeah. And your manager is never going to be happy. <laughs> no, the, they can never sell enough. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah. So is there, since like a lot is largely dependent on like either public funding or like tied to institutional like resources, is there like an accessible art or like gallery scene um, that artists can like participate in or is it Um, really just like large fine art companies kind of? No, I mean, every city has at least a couple of small spaces, but the, I think the competition for gallery spaces is huge. Like getting into group shows isn't particularly difficult. Mm -hmm. Um, Especially, I mean, for me as working in photography, it's not difficult to ship work. It's like I can I can send it rolled up with some magnets if I need to. It's it's showable. Um, 
But if you if you're someone who requires space, of which the UK doesn't have much of it, we're a compact, compact nation. So our cities are compact. Uh, we're, we're buildings are compact. Um, yeah, that, that that can really be an issue. I mean, I've been a practicing artist since I graduated in two thousand and six, and I've never had a, a solo exhibition. Every one that's been a possibility has always fell through for one thing or another often funding related on their side rather than mine. And you know, I've exhibited in group shows pretty heavily, published several books and um like to the point I, showing in galleries just isn't part of my practice anymore through just mm-hmm. sheer practical reasons because it doesn't happen so I can't focus that much time on it. You don't bet on a non sure thing, you know? Yeah, exactly. It's mm. like one thing you can definitely rely on is yourself. And yes. that's, I think that's an interesting way to segue into like the publishing part of your work, or mm. at least like that side of your practice. So like, when did you start publishing as part of your practice? You said you graduated in 2000. Um, I came from the DIY punk background. So fanzines have been part of my life since I was a early teenager. Mm-hmm. Um, I've always liked the idea of like self control. Um, discovering indie record labels um, that definitely sparked something like independent in me, young. Um, from a bit of a family of like anti authoritarians, we've got that sort of streak. And when I left uni in two thousand and six, I didn't publish straight. I, I did put a zine out quite early on which did very little, but then I didn't know how to market it. There wasn't the, that boom of indie bookshops that were like art focused, hadn't quite clicked yet. It was um, sort of ahead of the curve. It was in like the photo blog scene at the time when you had like Alex Soth was blogging and Amy Elkins and Cara Phillips and photographers like that. And there was like a really healthy lot of, um, I guess it would have been quite similar to having a zine, but you, you weren't relying on the um, algorithm that is pervasive now. It was yeah, literally it's a big, big, it's big change with social, like, from the blogging world to like social media yeah. now. And like, I wasn't even like active on the internet, like during the blogging era. Mm. So like, I didn't have a lot of experience with that. I kind of wish I did. <laughs> it, it was an interesting time. Definitely. I've, Noticed a lot of photographers from that era just have moved on because I guess it's, it's principle of you've got a thousand followers on Blogspot and a thousand people saw your post, you've got a thousand followers on Instagram and eight people have seen it. Um, but yeah, so I, I published, it was called Shred, um, it was hand, hand bound little. But I've tried to rework it a few times, so I don't think it. I don't think it's good enough to warrant the time or effort, really. Um, then I started Brownell Press, which is my little small press publishing concern in 2013. So it was my 10th anniversary last year. That um, I had the idea for that for a while and never quite had the kick. Won the first 8 by 10 prize and I went to New York and exhibited and was walking around like Dashwood Books and Printed Matter and places like that. And I just saw so many people doing what I wanted to do and didn't, I knew how, but I didn't, I hadn't put the pieces together mentally. And then I was just like, I'll do it. I'll design it. I'll send it to a print shop. I'll buy some envelopes. I'll buy a rubber stamp. I can do it. And I did. Um, after New York, I flew to, uh, Honolulu and Hawaii for a few months and I drew the logo in a coffee shop there it was, uh, our international claim to fame um, along the road from a church that was in Lost for any TV nerds who are listening to this and um, yeah it's been the biggest single change to how I see art and the vehicle for distributing art that I've encountered. I've tried to keep Brown Opera slightly separate from my own stuff, even though I have published my own work. 
um, mm-hmm. simply because a lot of what I do with Bob is quite practical. I handle the design, the accountancy, the logistics of all of it. But 100% it feeds back into what I do. And it's definitely meant that I'm just seeing work almost 100% as like a sequential thing rather than um, you know, traditional photo essay. Or, um, yeah, it's a lot different than just looking at photos hung on a wall. 100%. Because um, you can, I don't know, there's a standard rhythm to books when people do what they want in galleries. They'll stop and stare at one and they'll stand back. And um, but they can do it back. They can do it back to front, which is something I often walk around galleries backwards for some reason. Uh, given it some thought, I was reading a book called Understanding Comics by Scott McCloud, which was like a real um, like primer into how comics or graphic novels, the sort of longer form comics, are built and constructed. And um, like I realized how many like, parallels there are between the two forms and a lot of photographers really want to be seen as poets and Mm -hmm. I get it I get the romance of it all or they want to think of themselves as like small time filmmakers and I can see that also but the actual mechanical construction of frame to frame yeah comics is almost 100% the same thing you know, you've got the idea of gutters, framing, uh, whatnot, um, like how much, like which frames you take out. Um, you couldn't do that with a movie because you've, you, you take that frame out, it doesn't matter. It's, it's, it's literally, there's hundreds of them. Um, uh, so yeah, that was, uh, that was a big, that was a really big moment in my work when I realised that like, zine making was, really at the heart of what I do because it's the best vehicle for distributing my ideas. So you said that you kind of wanted, you wanted to make zines for a long time and you wanted to like, you saw all these publishers in New York and then it clicked for you. Yes. So like, how, I guess what was like one of the bigger challenges for actually setting it up as like a business? Um, one of the things that uh, looking through were rose tinted glasses because I can look back on it. Um, I didn't have enough of a plan going in. I understood basic in and out accountancy. Um, you know, you've, you've got a balance sheet. Um, I could understand that. Um, but I didn't have enough of a long-term plan. I think I had three names written down on a bit of paper for people I was going to ask to do work. I hadn't even asked them at this point, so I started Bernal Press without a yes. I, I published my own thing to start with. Um, but you saw I had four names, and one of them said no when I got the other two, didn't. Yeah, I, I maybe should have had more of a plan, but I think that was part of the fun of it was that it could be, it didn't have to be super heavily planned out. It, it wasn't really that expensive to begin with. The, the cost of printing, especially back 10 years ago, the cost of paper has gone up like, exponentially in the past like, two years. It was really cheap to put the first title out, which was by me. Um, so I was almost like the guinea pig of trying um, and... Yeah, there was a bit of a perfect storm. I had a little bit of notoriety after winning the first eight by ten prize. That had a few eyes on me. There's a couple of collectors who were interested. Um, I guess like printing was cheap. That the dreaded algorithm hadn't kicked in. So with five hundred Twitter followers, when Twitter was still a good arts platform, I sold like seventy five copies within a handful of weeks. That doesn't happen now. Even for mm-hmm. more notable artists, it's um, you know, selling selling copies is a lot more difficult. So my ignorance was kind of hidden by a, a perfect storm of things just being a bit easier. There's also mm-hmm. a lot less competition in terms of people putting zines out. There's was, there was plenty of it, but now there's, you see 
little small presses opening all the time. Basically, every every university year when someone's graduated, there's one or two start, and they've got that cool new thing about them. And um, Final Press went from being like, it was never cutting edge. I've never really pushed the edges of design or concepts, but I think I've reached that point where it's not like it's not particularly cool anymore. Um, it mostly publishes, you know, the quiet photographic poems, and it's a lot of um, DIY, punk, and hardcore related um, things, which is a, a musical ghetto, definitely. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it's never going to cross over and it, it can't and it shouldn't and I don't particularly want that to uh... and the algorithm that's that's come up a couple times at this point <laughs> yeah what I guess like describe that like difference because I don't think a lot of people realize it until it's I think we're all at that point with these platforms where mm-hmm we recognize like how easy it used to be to get seen and like build on them. And now it's become like very difficult. I think for a lot of people, like what, what did, what does that look like for you? Um, I mean, I'm saying it from both ways as a fan. Um, You know, I follow on my personal account. I follow artists that I love, uh, musicians, and I don't see their things. Um, and yeah, you know, that, that that stings as a fan. So as a as a an artist and as a publisher, like, you put a lot of work into stuff, and like likes don't matter in themselves. They're just a reflection of like a percentage of people who will have seen your work. Because you know you you've got people who will like any post. So you know if your friend Joe who likes every post doesn't like your post your friend joe hasn't seen it so you can assume that he that's one of so many people that's just not reaching it um which i mean these companies owe you nothing particularly but also you've went to the effort to build like an audience who theoretically want to see what you're doing and you can't provide what they want what you want and it doesn't seem to work for anyone because I mean, I used to maybe Twitter was more of an example. It, it, instead, it, you get some sort of advert for like some crypto company, which is the, you know, I've got a community note that it's a scam. So no one's clicking on it. Like mm-hmm. nothing, like no part of that works for anyone. Um, yeah, and the, com- the company makes a loss. And like, the, maybe I'm naive, but it, it just feels there has to be a better way than that. It's weird, right? Because it feels like they used to be great places for independent artists or like small companies to like really like show off and build. Mm -hmm. And now it's like all these platforms have the same features and they do the same thing. And everyone is like upset about them, but there's no alternative right now for at least building like a good community. So it's like... I don't know. It's just something I've been thinking about a lot. It's like where is like where to build more for community, more for artists. Like, is it in real life? Is it online? Is it like a mix in between? Um, I'm not sure. What always confused me was um, having this algorithm is like a push towards advertising, but mm-hmm. the advertising doesn't go to where you'd want it to be. So if I had things how they were, where the people that were seeing, who wanted to see my work, saw my work, I would probably advertise to grow my audience to people who just don't know that it existed. Mm -hmm. I'd I'd be tempted to spend advertising money with um, Instagram and Twitter. But now I've got no faith that these views that I would get would come from anyone that wants to see my work, even with the very tight advertising um, uh, guidelines that there are on there. Um, there's, I, I mean, I've noticed there's been a push in the past four or five years towards mailing lists, mm-hmm. but people have got to sign up for them, and it's not the same as clicking like on a Instagram account. You'd have to engage with this person's 
work in some form to begin with. So getting that sort of level of um, eyes on it is difficult. I mean, uh, when I do a book fair, I've always got a little sign-up sheet that people can write their email addresses on. There's a thing to check out where people can add their mm-hmm. email address. They can subscribe. Now, I went through a time of um, trying to uh, just not use it as just a sales platform. I tried to have some it use the word content. It sounds so shallow, but if someone actually gets something for their the money for the effort. So I was doing a bunch of interviews with artists, curators, when I was calling it the Bono Press Dispatch. So you get, we once a month there'd be a, an interview and there'd be, say, five stock questions and then maybe three or four personalised questions about their, like, a project they've worked on and whatnot to try and, like, push the community side of things. People just, I, mean, I got some nice feedback from it, but people didn't really sign up for it. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe I should have pushed it some more. Maybe people just don't want their marketing emails mixed in with this. Uh, maybe it, they don't trust my what I'm trying to do. Maybe maybe it looks too mercenary. Yeah, it wasn't particularly. It was. I mean, some of it was just me focusing on some artists that I like and a bunch of friends. And yeah, it's a tough balance. Like. Because you, like, you know, at least artists don't always want to come across as, like, selling or, like, trying to, like, just be like, here, buy this, buy this, buy this. It's like, you know, our whole thing is providing value, providing something to look at. Like, so I think it's unnatural for us to try and, like, be like, oh, let me get, like, start an email list and then I'll write this newsletter and then I'll, like, sell this book. through. Like, it's just... It's fucking too much. It's crazy. Yeah, you, you want the work to... It, you shouldn't really have to sell it. You should be like, I've got this really cool book. Look at this. Look at this. Um, the Artist X is saying this. And the sale should come once people have invested in the, the ideas because that's all you ever really want people to do is invest in what you're saying. You know, the, the time to, to connect with it and then hopefully that will end up with them wanting to buy it. But the, the whole marketing side of things is just a little bit beyond me. Mm-hmm. I mean, book, book fairs can be fun, but I tend to find they're either all or nothing. They sell a lot. or I've, I mean, I've had a few where I've sold zero. Um, I'm pretty good with people. I work in bars and I've got a public-facing job and I can like, happily chat to anyone. And I sometimes just get like, yeah, I feel like an ogre sometimes. Um, uh, I, I don't know if uh, the broken nose maybe scares people off or whatever, but um, it's always a mixed bag. And Newcastle is quite geographically isolated, so it's not like I've got a bunch of book fairs on my doorstep to do. Mm-hmm. I'd normally do the Brighton one every two years, simply because my best friend is from Brighton, so it was a nice excuse for me and him to have a trip away and I would see his parents, or so, so like nanny and uncle to me, and I knew a lot of people in Brighton. And then the, the past like, since COVID, people have moved away, and my connections to Brighton are lessened, and and, and yeah. it, it, it can be expensive. Yeah, you know, travel within the UK is almost prohibitively expensive. It costs me more to go to London than it does to any European city. That's crazy to me. Like three times as much. I can go to Berlin four times for the price of a trip to London. What? <laughs> that yeah. Makes, that makes no sense to me. Which is why I go to Berlin so much and I never go to London. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Are you finding that like other countries in Europe are more like welcoming? Or is there more of like a scene that you can participate in? There was until the UK voted for Brexit. <laughs> <laughs> which is the big, uh, when it comes to publishing, that is the huge elephant in the room. Um, the, the European market, almost, let me say the European market, Germany, Netherlands, France, is probably 60% of my audience. And that's gone because uh, it's, it's boring, but there's a change with the customs that um, we could send uh, port, we could 
sell within the European Union and not be charged uh, value-added tax. Now, the way it's done, people get stung with a, a tax bill upon, well, they should, upon receiving a, a book. So just no one buys them. I at least get one or two uh, every couple of months as opposed to almost daily. That's crazy. That's, yeah. I mean... Theoretically, I need a work permit to go over there. I mean, depending on what I'm doing, I'm, I might... Uh, I, I never got a work permit when I was in the States, anyway. Um, but <laughs> that was a long time ago. If you're listening, immigration officers, I would be a good boy now. Um, <laughs> but... Yeah, if I was exhibiting over there, especially if I was going to be uh, get any sort of funding while there, I think I'd have to be quite careful because mm-hmm. I think there'd be too much risk of get Like if I got caught doing something like that in Germany, maybe I wouldn't be able to get in any part of the EU. Yeah, might like be an you issue. could like lose like a business license or like some weird thing like yeah. that. that- I've got friends who, more on the music side of things, I've got a couple of DJ friends who've overstayed visas and uh, and they've got like a year-long ban from the EU. Damn. Yeah, it's it's, it's tricky. I think, and I mean, maybe being overly optimistic here, I think as the UK heads towards this government end, and I think there'll be some thorn between the EU and the uh, UK heads and i'd imagine there'll be a lot of like waivers will come in place mm-hmm. it's just until then it's it's a bit difficult jesus man yeah it's it's the most short-sighted thing imaginable and i've, I've got no the, the the eu has got many of its own problems as well um mm-hmm. don't think i think it's the kids talk to say everyone who voted to leave was an out and out racist and everyone who voted to stay was to necessarily uh, had the the right idea but it was all it was always a bad idea from the get-go um, it, it was never going to be handled very well here we are <laughs> <laughs> here we are uh post pandemic post brexit and everyone is just feeling isolated it sounds like yeah um I mean, COVID wasn't especially a bad time for me because my parcels are quite small and I could send them. Mm -hmm. So I was still, uh, most of my practice is studio-based. I say studio-based, it's a Mm -hmm. a home office come studio. I've got a spare room, I think it's just from my work. Same. Um, The studio sounds very grand. So... I spend a lot of time by myself anyway, so like for me, COVID wasn't a particularly bad time. Um, I've never been that um, sociable. I go to a lot of gallery opens. Mm-hmm. I certainly yeah. don't go to gallery opens of people I don't know. But yeah, I, you I don't too enjoy... broken up about like the clubs and the bars being closed. That was tough. Um, um, I mean, Newcastle's notoriously a party city. Probably mm-hmm. the party city. It's got a lot more to it than that, but um, it, it does have a good. No, that was that was difficult. And they like, live music with my job. I, a lot of my friends are in bands or DJs, and um, it was pretty hard seeing them not work for two years. Um, the galleries actually worked quite well with the when the restrictions came in because yeah, you know, a white cube having people social distance and mask up, it wasn't hugely a problem. Mm-hmm. You, know, you kill the ambience of a bar if one wearing a mask and standing apart from each other. A gallery, it's actually a bit easier because you can see things. Yeah, everyone can just like ignore each other like they were planning to do anyway at a gallery. Exactly, but you're doing it to save lives rather than for any social anxiety <laughs> or whatever. Mm-hmm. And then I'm going to transition off of mm-hmm. um, covid because I want to talk about DIY and punk before cool, yep. before we wrap this up, um, because I'm a big fan of that whole scene and that style, and I think that is that a Death Wish can... records? Sure, no, yeah, skateboard. Oh, wait, okay. Yes. Death Wish Skateboard Company. 
I suppose it's probably a, it's a cool word. It'll be used. And... <laughs> <laughs> no, but um, like I'm a big fan of like punk and DIY. So like I wanted to mm. talk to you about that because like that's a huge. I mean, UK punk and DIY is like, you know, one of the like original scenes for that. Like, so I guess like what like is the scene still active in a Newcastle or B like the UK as a whole? Yes and yes. Um, Newcastle has been really lucky. Um, two years ago, there's a DIY space open called the Lubber Fiend, which is like, it's just a square room with a bar and a stage at the other side. Uh, the lads who run it, Sam and Tom, it's like DIY lifers. And it's just had, it's really galvanised the scene. And you've noticed a lot of other little venues opened up in the meantime. So everyone's got room to play. Um, there's lots of, like, almost every music scene in Newcastle's buoyant. Even stuff I'm not that interested in, like Indie Schmendi bands. They've got mm-hmm. they've got places to play. And the, like, the place they play has got a gig on maybe every two, three days. So I'm assuming it's worthwhile them doing it, that these gigs continue. Um yeah, it's, it's really healthy. Um, the UK has always had like quite a. It was always called the network of friends, the European touring network, which I, I loved that when I first heard it, like an eighties term, network mm-hmm. of friends, and that that still exists now. So you know a band who's played in Newcastle is probably playing in either Sheffield or Leeds tonight. Then they'll play the other one of those the night after. Then they're going to Manchester, then to Liverpool, and so it goes. Um, the so all those a lot of um, issues with uh, work visas post Brexit. I think a lot of people have still managed to sneak in. There's not been that many like DIY bands I can think of that have had the tours cancelled because of immigration issues. Like mm-hmm. from the the states last year, I saw Smirk play from California. I think uh, so. Homefront from Canada. Australia's Alien Nose Job, um, uh, Die Valera from, from Germany, Glass from Germany. Yeah, there's, there's been so much good stuff happening. Um, maybe not enough bands forming in response to that. There's plenty of bands, but the, the bands that are on like the sort of garage it's like that hardcore garage, kill by death sort of. Mm-hmm. Um, Post punk's been very much a theme of British guitar music for a decade now. I think it's time that maybe moved on because there's only so many bands who sound like Gang of Four I want to hear. Um, <laughs> and I say that and I went to see Gang of Four last year. So <laughs> that, I mean, like, that's really sick that everything is um, working out for the music scene. Like, um, it, do you see that contributing to like youth culture? Or do you see that contributing to like, um, like the art scene at all still, or is it like kind of separated at all? No, I can definitely say it. Um, I think there's an added sense of people seeing illustration and design as art rather than just like a functional tool. So like egg egg posters and whatnot I think are mm-hmm. being like really, really recognized as an art form in their own right in a way they hadn't in some time. Um, Lots of bands do tour zines. Like one of them might be a photographer. Feel that that blow over. In the past few years, so I've published. Um, there was a, a New York-based photographer called Brandon Alexi. I think he's in Buffalo, maybe. Yeah, yeah. some of his uh, photos that are class. So Karen Kershaw did a book which was um, DIY punk spaces was just photographs of empty DIY spaces. There's something so universal about that. I think this would like tie us all together. You know, anyone who spent time in those spaces would recognize you can smell them almost. I was you just know? about to say you could probably smell it. Yeah, it's um <laughs> it like it there's something so universal about that. Like I'm trying to keep that one in print at all times with her permission. Just because I think as a document it's it says something that because there's no people in it, so mm-hmm. band and scene is great, but the, a lot of the bands in that won't even be together now, let alone in in five years' time. So it, it exists as like a historic snapshot, and 
Cohen's scene has like a universality to it. Um, 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 a lot of find the punk scenes pretty. You can say that I'm a sort of similar, trying to say similar things. Because you know, a lot of my works were like frustration and um, not being not 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 lost in a metaphorical sense of lost like like lost in the woods like literally you don't know which way is north like a lot of mm-hmm. my works about that and like a, a geographical sense or the emotional sense there's definitely parallels and sympathy from other bands and whatnot and it all feeds in weirdly um i've never had been asked for me stuff to, to be used on a punk artwork but the techno community seem to love what I'm doing. I've got a bunch of covers coming over the next year or so. Um, but I, I like a lot of that music too, so it's not a, it's not a problem. It's awesome. Fuck yeah. Yeah. Punk for life. Um, I, I once seen on a gig poster, DIY or DIY bother, and that really stuck with me. Like That's that's how it is. That's how I've got to live. Uh, I don't have a choice in that. Uh, Mm-hmm. yeah it's like if you don't do it you're gonna go crazy anyway so exactly i can't leave someone if i just can't let someone else do it when i could mm-hmm. I, I, like some of that's probably a control issue but some of that's a respect and others time issue uh, it's, it's good mm-hmm. and bad mm-hmm. um, all right um all right before we wrap this up is there anything else that you wanted to like talk about or get off your chest um it's a good question. Um, I should have probably thought about this one before. Um, awesome. Something I would like to do um, more, and I've been thinking about quite a bit, is I'm not a natural collaborator. Mm-hmm. Um, when I work with people for Vernal Press, it's very much on a like traditional level. I'm acting as a designer first and then as a publisher. So uh, I am collaborating with them, but it's in like a where we're doing more separate things. Um, I'm hoping to maybe try and collaborate in a more artistic manner in my own practice over the next year. I've never totally figured what form that will take, um, but it's something I'm really, really anxious, anxious, I'm really happy to try because I think I'll get a lot of things wrong and mm-hmm. getting things wrong gloriously is where the art comes from, I think. Yeah. I think that's just about, you just got to find the right person to collab with. Yeah. That's the hard part. I'm not always the most easy going of people. So that's, that's that. I'm going to have to really check my ego a lot. I'm aware of that. You could have fooled me. You seem pretty, like, I feel pretty chill in this conversation right now. <laughs> Thank you. Just try making some art with me and you might think a little bit different. Um, I'm, I'm quite forthright and, um, yeah, it's something I've I've got a, I've talked to a couple of people, but yeah, you know, everyone's got busy lives. And I, I I like the idea of you know, reading about mail art of just mailing someone a packet of my photos, even like Xerox copies of them, and say do whatever you want with them. You know, set fire to them, put them in your fish tank, staple them to the post office walls, whatever you want, and let's see where this goes, and then they can send me back whatever comes and. I don't know. Um, maybe that could be cool. Really get weird with it. Oh, send some over. I'll collage with them. Yeah, glad. Uh, give me your address and I'll, I'll send you something over this week, probably. I'll shoot it over to you right after this. Yeah, cool. That'd be, that'd be a laugh. Uh, I'd like that. All right. That's that's the plan. That's going to be the first collab of the year. Yeah, brilliant. Um, watch, I'll be really easy going and then I'll turn. <laughs> <laughs> He seemed so nice. <laughs> he seemed so nice. What happened? <laughs> Furious at me. <laughs> nah, that'll be fun. Yeah, cool. I will do that. All and right. anyone listening to this, yeah, hit me up. I'm I'm willing to. The 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 less likely the better. Almost. Yeah. All right, you heard it here. Shoot this man a DM. Yep. Uh, that's a perfect segue to plug all your socials. 
Cool. Um, my Instagram is alt.palmer. I have to take a sketchbook. You can see work that uh, work in progress, deranged half ideas that I'm struggling with in the middle of the night. Um, don't do much in the stories. I'm super current affairs on that. Anyone who takes political information from me probably shouldn't take political information from anyone is the way I've seen that, other than occasionally the odd Here's some resources, because I think if you've got a thousand followers or so, occasionally maybe you need to use that platform, not for um, posturing, but for uh, just here are some resources. Use them as you will. Um, So I've got that. There is my website is alpharma.co.uk. Bernal Press can be found at Brunel Press on every form, on every platform, and brunelpress.com. Uh, we've got a 34th book coming out next month, if I manage to get everything finished in time. Next uh, month from now is March. So... Oh, oh, wait, no, it's this month. Sorry, if I get everything done in time, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah well, um, well spotted. Yeah, this month... That, so that'll be already out by the time this comes out. So this yeah. episode will be, I'm, I'm this episode will be out in like April, maybe. I'm like April. really far ahead. I'm like oh, wow. really far ahead with my schedule. Wow, that's you're an organized man. Um, <laughs> see what I was saying earlier in the thing about um, time management. This fella has got it sorted. So get your time management hit tips from. <laughs> um, uh, so yeah, by April I should have three. I've got a title up for pre-order now. That will be out, and hopefully three more things. Um, wow, yeah, that, there should be plenty to see by the time this comes up. All right, you heard it here first. Al Palmer, Brown Owl Press. All right, thank you, man. Thank you very much. I had a great time in this interview. Great chatting to you. Sweet, me too. I'll catch you later. Bye.